joining us, award-winning entrepreneur, technologist, the first person to hold a PhD in African American studies. Really? At yes. the at Northwestern University? Yes. You better come on, yes, first PhD, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Dr. Courtney Ziegler. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming through. I really, really appreciate it. So you got a PhD in African American studies? Yes, I have a PhD. I call it a PhD in black people. So. <laughs> so wait, you're young. So how are you the first to have one at um, Northwestern? I finished school when I was 29. So I was in a PhD at the University of Illinois. Northwestern had started a program in 2006, and I was like, I would rather transfer okay. there. Okay. So, so it was I, a new program. It was a new program. Okay. Because um, I was like, how is that possible? <laughs> it was a new program, and um, I was their first graduate for about three years. But now there's many of us. So. Okay, but you you came through and broke the mold. Yeah. I love it. Nice. I love it. And I love people who study black people. Yay. All right. So how are you a technologist? So if you're the African-American studies, I think that is actually foundational. Michelle Obama has an African-American studies degree from Princeton. I think it's found. I think every black person in America Agreed. should at least know their history, period. And then you could do other things and other things grow out of your knowledge yourself. Agreed. So how did you become a technologist? Um, I guess uh, I'm, I'm an elder millennial, so I kind of grew up with technology. Wait, 29 is an elder millennial? Because I've seen it was calling himself a millennial. He damn sure he's not here today. I'll, yeah. troll, him. I'll troll him later. Um, All right. Okay. And well, I'm not 29 now. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay. I finished my uh, PhD okay. a few years ago. Um, so I'm in my 30s. But um, so I grew up with technology. I'm an 80s baby. Kind of always had a computer. Um, well, on the cusp of like getting uh, internet as a young child. Um, and there's just always being in love with technology. And so always wanting to create with it. Um, I went to school and finished my college degree and got a degree in film and digital media. And so that really kind of, at that moment, um, which was different than now, you had to learn how to edit and use technology in a very different way. Um, then it's super easy now. Um, and so that was also kind of another introduction of me being a technologist and just kind of like teaching myself how to code, build websites and ended up in the tech industry. Did you build Appalachian yourself? I did not build it. We have an engineer. Um, okay. I'm beyond the building stage now. Okay. <laughs> I'm like the leader. <laughs> okay. Um, like yeah, no, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, no, uh, we did not, I, I did not build it, um, but I am the founder and kind of the the person that conceived of the idea. All right, Appalachian, A-P-P-O-L-I-T-I-O-N, like abolition, but it's Apple. It's an abolition, it's freedom involved mm. in that. Mm. Tell us about this um, app that you have created yes um yeah so um my full-time job is working in the technology industry of a startup um, we build a number of things um, we build live video software we build um i also had an organization for trans people in tech um so uh, just being in the technology industry and always wanting to create something that's i guess for black people <laughs> um always trying to figure out how i can like divert resources to black people um and so i was inspired by an organization called national bailout and they are a collection of grassroots of charitable bail funds and um, organizations that do uh, a yearly event where they bail black mothers out of jail. Um, my black mother's in jail, well, in prison. And so I, I was intimately affected by that. I was like, wow, that's so awesome. They raised about a million dollars. And it was kind of like just grassroots door to door, um, knocking on people's doors, uh, hitting up organizations. And that really inspired me. And I was like, how can I bolster the work that they're doing? And so I tweeted one day, what if there was an app that leveraged the spare change um, roundup model that's popular and it bailed people out of jail? People were like, word, really? That's cool. So I made it happen about three months after that tweet. How does that work? So if we uh, download or upload or put, uh, what, do, how, how do, what do you call it? Upload or download into your phone? Is it, how do we? All right. Download. Get it. Download. How about that? Get it. Get the <laughs> yeah. app. If we get the Appalachian app and connect it, it connects to our bank or yes. to our credit card yes so the way that it works um we are a web-based app because we wanted people everybody to be able to access it um so you go to appalition.us um you sign up you link your debit card that you use every day um we are a safe platform we are use the same technology as every other kind of fintech platform such as uh, robin hood or digit um, so we're built on top of the same thing for security reasons. Um, you link your spending card, whatever you spend ever since then, we automatically take the change. So if I bought something for $1.50, Appalachian will go in your bank account and take that 50 cents. We will then divert those funds um, to a bill fund. And how much have you diverted thus far? Uh, about half a million dollars. Not bad. Wow. Appalachian, A-P-P-O-L-I-T-I-O-N dot us. Okay, so your mom's in jail or mm -hmm. in prison. 
and there is a difference because mm-hmm. jail is before you're sentenced um, or the other way around. Yes. It's, jail is like short term, I guess. Okay. County jail is um, prison. It's like a long term. When did your mom go to prison? Uh, I grew up with a mother who's mentally ill. And so that kind of like my entire life, seeing her being sick and going in and out of jail because you know Cal- I'm from California. We don't rather really have the resources. I don't think anywhere in the States has the resources to really handle mental illness and then especially with black folks. Um, so that kind of led to her getting into some trouble and being in jail, so in prison. Um, and she's probably going to be there for, she's in her 60s, probably the rest of her life at this point. When was the last time you saw her? <sighs> Good question. About a couple of years ago. Um, it's really difficult for me to go see her. Um, like I said, just growing up with a parent that's mentally ill and then becoming an adult and also an adult who's built something that's uh, focused on mass incarceration. I feel like... Uh, I feel like a poser if I don't actually go see my mom. Um, so that's something I deal with. But I'm actually going to go see her this month. Okay. For the and the holidays have to be tough mm-hmm. as well. Um, Definitely. Talking with Dr. Courtney Ziegler. And you can follow Dr. Courtney Ziegler at Fake Rapper. Why? Uh, it's a funny story. <laughs> when I was uh, writing my dissertation, I handwrite and I was in a coffee shop. And I live in Oakland, California. And Oakland's going through hyper gentrification. And this woman came up to me and she's like, Oh, at a coffee shop, just randomly. Oh, are you writing rap lyrics? And I'm like, no, I'm actually writing my mother dissertation. Like, <laughs> and, um, I mean, I could be a rapper. There's nothing wrong with that. But the assumption that that's the only thing that I could be writing was, you know, rap lyrics. Um, I just thought it was funny, and so I've adopted the name Fake Rapper ever since. Um, people are like, why do you have that name? That's so insulting. I'm like, it's actually. I think it's a funny story, but yes, so. as I as she has her, uh, he has her his doctorate. Mm-hmm. Um, in Afro uh, black people, not just to keep it simple. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we were talking off mic about Disney because Angela E. Matthews is here, and we were talking about what D- Disney is trading at and what what we think is going to happen. And then Drew was like, "Why don't we have a?" a I think Kareem said, "Why isn't there a black streaming thing?" And I'm like, "BET Plus." And you were like, "No, <laughs> uh, nope, nope, nope. That's Viacom." And then Dr. Ziegler was like, uh, "There should be something." Should we put this out in the universe? Nope, don't do it. Okay. (laughs) Don't do it. All right, because I think you're going to create it. So I'm just going to say that, right? And and hopefully you use AI. Uh, because we need to see that too. I just because if you went from text to to app execution in like three months. Oh yeah. Look, I feel like I feel like you the one. Like yeah. when Bruce, when they say, "Are you the one?" Like, <laughs> that, that, that I mean, yes. like you may be the one. <laughs> yeah. One Doctor Ziggler. Yeah. Doctor Ziggler. Yeah. The one. <laughs> okay. All right, so, because I'm imagining Appalachian people who get into this space, this is not their only thing, you know. And I've been doing this long enough now to know that there's like. 7-Eleven different things that you're probably working on. So what what else are you doing? Um, so Appalachian has become kind of my f- part-time job, significant t- part of my life now. Um, but I build software. Um, I have a headquarters in Chicago. Although I live in Oakland, um, it's cheaper. To- <laughs> my co-founder lives in Chicago, and so it's cheaper for us to have an office there. And so I'm actually going there next week to go back and forth. We have an office on the south side of Chicago. We're the only... Um, I guess tech startup on the south side, like south, south side of Chicago. Wow. Um, she's from Chicago, and so it was really important for us to open up an office there. Um, so that's really cool. So that's what I do with my most of my time, and just really kind of focusing on how I can. I'm a I'm a Sagittarius and a workaholic, so the idea I talked about earlier, who knows, maybe that may happen, but definitely always figuring out like um, <laughs> what else can I do, how many things can I kind of like get myself involved in. And getting back to the Afro African American studies, the black the study of black people, um, I I said I think it should inform everything that we do in business. How does it show up for you? Um, yeah, I'm every every day. Um, I am very lucky to have an academic background, being in the technology industry. Um, I have a very critical way of thinking differently in business. So that, that's such a gift, I understand. Um, but also, I'm able to, again, with an app like Appalachian, for example, able to be very, I think, smart about trends that are happening and apply them to kind of solutions for black folks because I have this kind of knowledge base, not only lived experience, but like this knowledge base of kind of what's happening in the field of what folks are studying. Um, and so that has helped me even just like another example academically um the folks who study like uh mass incarceration and, and things that are happening and, and data from that has really helped guide it how i've led abolition into where it is now so this is an, kind of... an amazing app I'm, I'm on the site now it's dope 
yes, we have thousands of users um, giving money every day. <laughs> and um, it's really, oh, sorry, we have thousands of users giving, giving money every day. And it's really, really exciting to see, because we are user driven, um, it's exciting to see folks be educated about what bail is. Um, a lot of people had no idea. They're just like, why are you just getting criminals out of jail? And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> um, let's actually talk about what bail is. Um, so what is bail? So bail is uh, if someone is charged with a crime and the, the, a judge grants someone bail, depending on what I, I'm not sure what how the judge decides that. Um, but, you know, we can go into a conversation about that, but um, a judge grants an individual bail so that they would show up for their court case. Right. Um, and they're not guilty. Exactly. They're just charged with a crime. Exactly. Um, and the data that I've learned from doing this in the space now is that like overwhelmingly, like 98 percent of people who are charged with a crime and who do are able to pay their bill show up to court. And usually they're, they, they, the charges are dropped. Um, but yeah, like 98 percent of those people show up who are granted bail. And so a lot of folks, when they were learning about abolition and we're like why would i give money to get a criminal out of jail and it's just like well actually like let's sit back and like let's think about how bail works like you can't and no everybody doesn't get bail like a judge has to say you know we are granting this to you um so if sandra bland had made bail uh she would probably be here today khalif browder had he gotten bail and they found him didn't even charge him with anything exactly three years in jail for not even being charged exactly. because he couldn't make bail. So that's how significant this is. This is important. Mm -hmm. And bail bail in a lot of communities it just eventually becomes a poverty tax mm -hmm. for for most for for most people in urban areas and people of color, particularly African Americans, bail the bail process is a poverty tax. Exactly. Because you may have someone sit in jail for uh who should who should probably only be in jail for 48 hours maybe uh, while they make bail, but because bail is something like $2,000, $3,000, they may sit in a jail cell for months, lose jobs, lose benefits, lose their residence, lose, become homeless because they could not make bail. And Usually it's, for some bull crap exactly. charge. Yeah. And, and some some that we've learned through abolition is that some folks have bail as low as like in the in the tens of dollars and cannot afford it and end up staying in jail for months. And there's some folks that we've actually um, learned from the bail funds that we work with that they've paid bail up to like $60,000 for someone who has committed, been charged with committing even a nonviolent crime, which is like ridiculous and how like different states um, decide how much a person pays bail and who can pay bail for that person. It's super fascinating, everything we learn. And um, it's really awesome that Appalachian provides this education to folks. Appalachian.us. How do you disperse the money? So the money comes in, you have half a million dollars. Yep. Who gets the bail? How do you determine who gets what? Yep. So the way users log, they log in, they link their card. Um, they are able to select which bail fund they want their money to go to. So if I am an abolitionist, I can go to my account and say, I want to give all my spare change to uh, Bronx Freedom Fund or Portland Freedom oh. Fund. Um, so we're, we're a crowdfunding platform. So it's like smile.amazon. So, so like exactly, that. exactly. Um, and they go in, when we first started, uh, we collected all the money and sent it to one organization which was in charge of 45 different bail funds. Um, and so they were in charge of it. But once we went back to the drawing board and reiterated and took feedback from users and was like, well, maybe we should have the users have their choice about who the money should go to. Um, it makes them want to be more involved. Um, it makes them feel more important as someone who is combating mass incarceration as well as more transparent with where, where their money is going. So, And why is only 85 percent of the, the money tax deductible? Um, because Appalachian itself is a technology um, and we keep 15 percent of every dollar to keep the operations and the lights on. Okay. Oh, cool. I have something to say. So what's really interesting is I think when people think about, say, hey, I'm going to give this bail um, money from my bank account to support someone whose bail needs to be paid, oftentimes I find that it's the family members that come in and pay for mm -hmm. other family members that are in trouble. Sometimes I'm, I'm from Queens, so you see those storefront shops that's like, yeah, we help you get your loved one back. Just put your house up and we'll mm -hmm. use your house as collateral. Or um, you can you know, put this on a card and we'll give you cash and we'll go about it this exactly. way. So it's really interesting that the person who didn't impact the crime oftentimes suffers from this because it's like, how am I gonna be a mom and watch my daughter, son, niece, grandson, whoever, be rotting away in a place that I know they shouldn't? 
in a lot of states you have you have to be a property owner or you have to to sign for somebody to yep. be out on a bond which is also crazy i can um like that that's another thing that is part of that process of if you've got to go the normal uh, bail bondsman route right like you go to the dude at the corner whose whose business is right down the street from the jail you may have to do it like you said put up your house as collateral and in some households maybe there's only one house in the whole family and you know mm-hmm. and, yeah, pretty, yeah. and nobody's gonna put big mama's house up to get you out of jail exactly. for something that we may think you may have done or may not have done right so it's a it's the whole process is so crazy. I mean, mm-hmm. this is amazing that that you're doing that because even even when we were talking about the Bloomberg thing, right? When we were talking about stop and frisk, out of out of all of those stop and frisk, ninety percent of those people were innocent. Yeah. Well, that's why mm-hmm. he was apologizing profusely. Mm-hmm. And even exactly. when they stopped it, crime still kept going down, exactly. which proves that there was no co- direct correlation to mm-hmm. disrupting all right. of those people's lives. Right. And Lowering crime. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a farce. 658,000 cases of stop and frisk at the height of, of Bloomberg. More black men were stopped and frisked than actually existed, That's which that. means that they were getting stopped two and three times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And tourists. And you said you're not accepting his apology. Let's no. just be clear. Bloomberg. Drew's not accepting his apology. I do not accept your apology. I do not. Bloomberg. Either. Nobody else. You can kiss my black that. stop and frisk <laughs> ass. I think there's going to be an annou- uh, presidential announcement coming out, and he needs the support. Of yeah. black people, and they said you need to clear this up. Yeah, of course. And yeah. so we're, I think we're be- not going for the okie doke. Let's stop. I don't care if you're Bloomberg or Kanye. When it, if it, I, I, I pause when the time that you come to apologize to me is when you need something exactly. from me. Mm-hmm. And it was really clear about that. That goes for relationships as well. Right. Uh, especially <laughs> relationships. All right, let me thank you, Doctor Ziegler. Will you come back? Because I, I got billion yes. and one questions. We just scratched the surface. Doctor Ziegler <laughs> at. At fake rapper, go yes. follow, follow <laughs> at fake rapper. Let me say it's like a high five. It makes I people smile. It. I love you. I love it. <laughs>